Hey everybody, welcome to the G. Louise book series. I'm Christina K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A. This is where we read books, talk about books. Just no special effects, no theme music, none of that special stuff going on here. Just reading books, talking books. And, um, so, uh, the month of, um, uh, the winter months, especially December, is a hard month for me because I lost my mom and my daughter. And just recently, I lost a, 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 my last living relative and my comfort care cat. So uh, I need to get another cat. Although, Miss Bossy over here. Might help. But she's. She's not the comfort care cat. The comfort care cat is the one that wants, will be held anytime you want. Wants to be petted anytime you want. Wants to be held anytime you want. Not the, I will be held when I want to be held cat. There's a difference. And they're rare. Those, those comfort care cats are rare. And, uh... Missy here is queen of the house since her elder sibling died uh, she's been very very happy <laughs> she's she's getting extra everything and she spoiled up the yin yang so like I was saying before um, I always tell people that if you're going through a difficult time and you've reached a point where you uh, would be comfortable having a laugh, having an excuse, having a small something to laugh about. I always say, pick up Janet Ivanovich. Uh, one for, we've done one for the money, we've done two for the dough, we've done three to get deadly, and we're doing four to score. And I am a Lorelei fan, and I'm a Susan Erickson fan. Um, if you watch my JD Rob videos. Ah, oh, itch. So anyways, um this I when I read these books, I think of donuts. When I see Dunkin' Donuts, when I see Krispy Kreme, when I see Cleck in the Bucket, I think of Janet. I associate these books with donuts and Krispy Kreme and clunk in the bucket. There's just no ends of so bad it's they're related. You can't think about one without the other. I'm driving down the street and uh, there's Krispy Kreme on the corner. I'm thinking Janet. I just, that's my association. Oh, and before I forget, please hit the like and subscribe. Let me know I'm doing a good job. I've got this fantasy going of having a thousand subscribers by Christmas, a miracle Christmas. I've, I've got 130 something now, and I'd really appreciate it. If I could use 900 more. If you could find 900 more people, that would be most appreciative. Uh, I can't do it. Um, you, you, the public, are the only ones I can sub count on. So um, we're talking Stephanie Plum here, and she is a bounty hunter. And she has a cohort, Lula, who's not quite yet fully engrossed yet um it's a slow i remember being quicker but apparently it, it wasn't it's a little slower on the uptake um we also have grandma mazur who is your comedy relief um we didn't get to funeral homes in this one but we will frequent them in the future joe morelli uh is her on again off again will be will be won't be when we'll boyfriend. Ranger is special forces and is the on again, on again, won't be, will be bed partner. Oh, I forgot to put this. So, um, then we have Connie Rizzoli is the office manager. Then we have Vinny. He owns the bond business. And, um, and then we have Lucille's wife. We have her mother and father. We have Mary Lou Molnar, her childhood best friend. Um, we have Big Blue. For the record, Big Blue will never, ever, ever, ever be injured. 
as far as I know, he will never be injured. Every other vehicle that Stephanie will ever own will be injured or died or destroyed or firebombed or something forever. Um, Joyce Barnhart is the woman she found in the dining room with her husband. She is the arts enemy and Joyce worms her way, as we will talk about later, into the Bonds office and offers to provide sexual favors to Vinny if she'll let him on the case. Uh, Dickie Orr is uh, Stephanie's former husband, the man that Joyce Barnhart was doing on the dining room table when Stephanie found them. Um, we will meet um, Angie Morelli, that's Joseph's mom in this book, and we will see Grandma Bella, who will become, I'm putting the eye on you, lady. Eddie uh, Garcia, Garza is her friend, and he's also um, husband to Shirley. And uh, we also have Carl Costanza. And uh, I wanted to make another few notes. Uh, we never, Ranger has secrets. Some secrets we won't learn, but some secrets we will learn in future. Um, whenever they're on a job together and it's a messy job, um, Ranger will never get dirty, ever. He will always come out spick and span, and Stephanie will be the one that gets slimed or food or anything covered. Um, oh, I forgot. To, Vinny's father-in-law, who will be mentioned in future books. Um, Larry the ha Harry the Hammer. He's mob. Salvatore Sweet, or Sally, is our new recurring character. Um, cross-dresser. And, uh... We yeah, Gram, Grandma Bella is a new a new recurring character. Joe Morelli's mom is a new recurring character. So, are you looking all cute or what? Let's see if I can just do. There she is. There's the ham. <laughs> okay, so we start the book off. Uh, she's got a new CRX. I believe um, the last car was the first car, the second car to be burned. In this, we get a few more cars added to the list. Um, she goes to the office and she wants to shoot Vinny. Apparently, Joyce Barnhart, like I previously mentioned, offers sexual favors uh, if she could be allowed to be one of the ones to bring in Maxine. So, uh, and Max and Joyce Barnhart is her arch enemy, and she hates Joyce Barnhart. So she has a few words with Vinny. Then um, Connie gives Stephanie a new FTA, Maxine Nowicki. Um, and her former boyfriend was Edward Kuntz, and he plays a part in this book. She goes to talk to Edward Kuntz. He says he has not seen Maxine in months. Stephanie goes to Maxine's apartment and finds a neighbor with a key. They find Maxine's apartment has been thoroughly, absolutely tossed and searched. Then she goes to see Maxine's mother. Her mom has not seen her. Steph goes to the bakery. Morelli meets her there. She hasn't seen him in months. They had a kiss. Um, then she goes to her parents to dinner and... She, when she had visited Edward Kuntz earlier in the day, she had given him his card. He lost his card, uh, so he called her parents' house, and her parents think that he's a potential boyfriend for her, and they invite him over for dinner. And uh, Stephanie's like, no, and she wants to run out the back door, but her mother tells her, no, she, she runs out the back door. She's not getting food. So Eddie says he called her mother because he lost the card and because he uh, got a call from Maxine she told him to expect an airmail package tomorrow and then tomorrow is Sunday and he doesn't know what that's going to be all about um, after dinner we have we will have a future recurring character she has not shown up yet and it will be a few books before she shows up but Valerie is mentioned every once in a while in the book she is Stephanie's sister um 
So after dinner, uh, after quizzing Edward at lunch at dinner, um, she goes to talk to uh, Marge, Maxine's best friend, and she finds out that Marge did not show up for work. And when she goes to talk to Marge later on, she discovers that Marge just had her finger cut off. And that's why she didn't uh, show up for work. So the next day being Sunday, the next day the airmail package is supposed to arrive, the day that airmail does not deliver, and it's a br brick through his window. Airmail, a brick through the window. And there's a bunch of letters on... The note is written in a scramble, so Stephanie takes it around her apartment, and because uh, uh, Ed Coon's officer a grand to solve the puzzle and find Maxine, so she takes the, the scramble to her apartment. She runs through her apartment, and they pass her up. Oh, I only do jumbles, or I only do the crosswords, or I only do this, and she ends up one of her neighbors. <laughs> You're pushing my papers um one of her neighbors refers her to their son salvatore sweet aka sally sweet a cross dresser and a member of a rock band and we will be seeing more of this rock band in future uh books but sally solves the puzzle really quickly um she says red and green and blue at cluck in the bucket the clue waits for you so Stephanie goes to collect in a bucket and discovers that the recycle bins are in these colors. The ones for trash, ones for recycle, ones for other stuff. So she calls Kuntz because there's no damn way she's coming in the dumpster. Kuntz ties a backhoe. The backhoe comes, empties the dumpster. She finds the clue. So then um, she's trying to find Sally's suite and she gets no answer. She calls Ranger. Ranger calls her. He needs help with an FTA. He wants her to put on a short dress, low cleavage, go to the funeral home, because that's where the person's going to be that evening to help him capture. Um, so she goes out to the funeral home that night to play pimp or prostitute, just play for like five, ten minutes to get the guy. And in the process, she runs into Terry Gilman. And she totally believes that Terry Gilman is a associate of Joe's uh, sexually, and she just goes on this high horse about Terry Gilman. In the meanwhile, she does get the guy to leave the building, but not before getting hairsprayed. It's a whole bunch of things. Um, the next day, Sally calls, um, and she reads him the she gives him the message, and he will get back to her when he's translated it. She tells Connie and Lula about the previous night, and they tell her about Terry Gazzoli working for the mob. Where is my other paper? Okay. So, uh, Sally comes to the office, and he's translated the message. It's an address. 132 Hauser Street. And the three of them, Lula, Sally, and Stephanie, go to Nowicki's house. That's Maxine's mom, Francine Nowicki. They get to Nuichi's house and they find the next clue under the house, but there's lots of spiders and everybody's afraid to get it, so they leave the clue there. But as in looking in windows, they see Mrs. Nowicki on the floor, bleeding everywhere from her top of her head. She's been scalped, so they call the police. So later on, um, Stephanie makes some calls and finds out that Maxine was seen recently at a 7-Eleven, and the 7-Eleven lady calls her and says, I have some info, please come later. Um, Marilee brings her, her dinner, some meatball stubs, and they get a little romantic, but he has no paraphernalia products, so they don't get romantic. Um, so they watch the Yankee game, and would like to point out, it depends where you live, uh, whether, depends where you live in New York on whether you are a diehard Yankee fan or a diehard Met fan. Especially those in Queens, um, it's against the law to like the Yankees in Queens. No, I'm kidding. But uh, being an Islander, I we went to see the Mets quite often growing up, and I will say that I really didn't care if the Mets were winning; they were my team. If the Yankees were winning, they were my team. 
And if you're in New York and you were alive in the 80s and you saw the ball run down the first baseline in the bottom of the ninth and it was awesome and the Mets won that year. It was awesome. So, uh, I am a Mankees, Yankees and Mets and Long Islanders. Those are the hockey teams. So I just thought I'd stick that in there. Um, so then Sally Sweet shows up with Joe's. Um, he shows up with the jar and gets in a little bit of a chip with Morelli, but everything works out. Sally leaves the jar with Stephanie. Stephanie tells Morelli about the jar. The clue reads, our spot, 3 p.m. Stephanie and Morelli talk about commitment. Now, um, uh, they have a spot, Morelli said. Makes me feel all romantic again. Maybe I should make a fast run to the drugstore. Suppose you went to the drugstore. How many would you buy? Would you buy one? Would you buy a month's worth? Would you buy a whole case? Oh, boy, Morelli said. Is this about the curtains? <laughs> Isn't it? Just want to get the rules straight. How about we live one day at a time? One day at a time is okay, I said, I suppose. So if I go to this drugstore, you'll let me back in? No, I'm not in the mood. In fact, I was suddenly feeling damn cranky. So the next day she goes to see Eddie Kuntz. He says our spot is the park bench. And she, Aunt, we first see Aunt Betty and Uncle Leo arrive in their town car. Um, she goes to talk to Miss Nowicki, uh, who might have cut her head. She denies knowing anything. Are you back? Are you back? You want some more lovin'? So a black Cherokee is following Steffi around town. Um, Stephanie goes to Point Pleasant to spend the afternoon when she gets home. Well, she went to look for Maxine because she was told that Maxine likes Point Pleasant. When she gets home, she gets a call from Sugar. Sally is missing. The black Cherokee turns out to be Joyce Barnhart. Apparently, Vinny didn't think Steffi. Stephanie was making enough progress with Maxine, so he gave the bond to Joyce. She's been following Stephanie around, figuring that Stephanie eventually, sorry, cut this itch, um, uh, that she will eventually find Maxine and Joyce is going to uh, take the credit for it. Tiny says she didn't give FTA to Joyce. Lula says um, she overheard uh, Vinny and Joyce Barnhart making animal noises, and that's why Joyce got the case. Uh, Lula shoots at Joyce's tires to prevent Joyce from following them. Lula and Stephanie go to see Eddie Kuntz, and once again, we learn that Betty and Leo are Eddie Kuntz's um, aunt and uncle. Uh, Lula's, Lula Sally go to the park, and uh, these guys come around with a uh, water... Uh, cooler and they're doing pies in their faces to everybody and apparently they're doing it to the wrong people because they were supposed to be doing it to Eddie Kuntz because when he gets in the pie in the face he's going to get the second clue so that happens there um they go back to, to her apartment and there's a note on her door I hate you and I will get even in black magic marker so she has uh, her apartment super fixed the door and she's thinking that it's per Morelli. And it's not per Morelli. Um, just a second. It's uh, a different situation where we won't find out to the end of the book. Um, so the lady from 7-Eleven calls her, says, I have a clue uh, for you. She goes to... Uh, uh, while before Stephanie can go to the 7-Eleven to talk to the woman, uh, she sees Joyce Barnhart parked outside. She calls Ranger for help. Ranger comes. He talks to her. And um, she leaves. And Stephanie's like, what did you tell her? 
And Ranger's like, well, I told her I'd be making ma passionate love to you all evening, and she should leave, so she leaves. She goes to the 7-Eleven, and, um, what did I say? She'll be back, Ranger said, but not tonight. How'd you get her to leave? I told her I was going to spend the next 12 hours ruining you for all other men, so she might as well go home. I could feel the heat rush to my face. Ranger gave me the wolf smile. I lied about being it tonight. And, spoiler, there will be a night. Or two. Or three. We, we will get there one day. Um... So Stephanie goes to the 7-Eleven to talk to this Helen lady and get the clues. But when she gets there, she finds the owner. She says the police called him. His store was open and vacant and there was no one watching it. And he's quite angry. They do find Helen four blocks from 7-Eleven dead. Uh, Stephanie decides to go to Ed Kunz's house to see if he has um, Helen uh, and while snooping around, peeking in the windows, Morelli arrives. He tells her he found Helen dead, four blocks in the 7-Eleven. He also tells her she, he might suspect Kuntz because Kuntz knew that Stephanie had gotten the phone call from Helen. And the next clue is in a bar for Marx with X. She calls Kuntz. He tells her he thinks Maxine was at his house last night, but it was Stephanie and Joe peeking in the windows. But he did find a box on his back porch, Mac marked with X and he thinks it's filled with pudding and the notes in the middle of a pudding it is not pudding it is dog stuff um someone bring uh Maxine brings Hans away into Stephanie's apartment with a vase of flowers and has a gun on her and handcuffs Stephanie to the fridge and leaves and she has to um Sally Sweet comes over and um, they get bolt cutters, and Stephanie walks around with the handcuff on her arm for a while. Um, so then someone left a note on her windshield to stay away from her boyfriend, and Stephanie thinks it was Terry Gilman, and that the boyfriend was Morelli. Again, she's incorrect, but she doesn't know this at the time. Um, she calls Lula for a ride, and they both go to Kuntz. The box is filled with the dark stuff. She calls Morelli, and he tells her he doesn't have a girlfriend. He says Terry Gilman would not pour gasoline on her car. She would do something else. So, um... Who enjoying the paper? She loves paper. Um... Where is it? When was the last time you saw Terry? About a week ago, I saw her. I ran into her in Fer Ferriello's deli. She was wearing a little denim skirt, and she looked very fine, but she's not the woman in my life right now. I narrowed my eyes. Who is the woman in your life right now? You, he says. Oh, then what is this boyfriend stuff all about? Maybe it's Maxine. You said it happened after she changed you to the refrigerator. And she's talking about Kunz. I don't know. It doesn't feel right. It's not. She's wrong. So now um, Mrs. Nowicki shows up and she says Maxine has moved to Atlantic City. And she flicks a cigarette and Stephanie's car blows up because it, Maxine had covered it in gasoline. And uh, Lula's file bird also goes up too. And Kunz calls, and he's found the note. And Stephanie goes to her parents for dinner, and what she mentions that they're going to go to Atlantic City. So Sally, Grandma, Lula, and Stephanie go to uh, Atlantic City. They lose a few dollars. And when Stephanie gets home, her, her apartment has been firebombed. So, um... The phone rang six times before Joe answered with a mumble hello. Joe, I said, it's Stephanie. Does this involve death? Not yet. Does it involve sex? Not yet. I can't imagine why else you'd be calling me. Someone firebombed my apartment tonight and I need a place to stay. Where are you? In front of your house. An upstairs curtain was pulled aside. I'll be right down, Joe said. Don't get out of your car until I open my door. And he goes and gets her. 
um, she was gonna say to folks, but if folks only have one bathroom. Another thing is the, um, the line to Morelli's mouth tightened. Let me get this straight. Yesterday, someone actually blew up your car and your apartment, and now you want to move in with me. What do you hate? <laughs> You're a walking disaster. You're a calamity drain in fucking spandex. I'm not a walking disaster, but he was right. I was a walking disaster. I was an accident waiting to happen, and I was going to cry. My chest ached. My throat felt like I'd swallowed a baseball, and tears gushed out. Shit, I said, wiping the tears away. Morelli grimaced and reached out to me. Listen, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. There's a little romance blooming here. So she has some stuff with Morelli. And it pisses her off when she walks into the office. Oh my God, Connie said when I walked into the office. You did it. Excuse me? How was it? I want details. Lula looked up from the stack of files she was sorting. Yep, she said, you did the deed all right. I felt my eyes go wide. How do you know? I sm sniffed at myself. Do I smell? Uh, you just got that look like you've been totally uh, effed. Lula said, sort of relaxed. Yeah, Connie said, satisfied. It was the shower. I said, I really took a long shower. Wish I had a shower like that, Lula said. Is Vinny in? Hey, yeah, Vinny. He got back last night. Hey, Vinny, Stephanie's here. We heard a mumble, oh, Christ, from deep inside his office. And he opened his door. What? Joyce Barnhart, that's what. So I gave her a job. Vinny squinted at me. Jesus, you just get laid. Everybody knows. Um, uh, where is it? Um, a ranger walks in the room. He stared at me for a moment and smiled. He raised his eyebrows. Morelli? S-H-I-T, I said. This is embarrassing. Everybody knows that Stephanie was with Morelli. Everybody. So, um... The story continues, uh, Stephanie and Joe go to Point Pleasant to talk to Maxine, but no one's ha there, and the past has been trashed. Then uh, Ranger comes by, um, he's got an FTA Norval, and he wants Stephanie to be the distraction, and they go to get Norval, and he throws everything but the kitchen sink at them, and... Ranger walks out spotless, and Stephanie walks out wearing ketchup, mustard, mayonnaise, and everything else in the world. Um, they have dinner at Stephanie's par uh, Joe's parents, and Grandma Bella's like, I see babies in your future, and all this stuff. Grandma Bella gets it. Um, so, then they go to a bar, and Kunz gets a note there, and he disappears after that. And Joe finally confesses to her that he's been on a money laundering case. And they've been watching this 7-Eleven where Helen got, her informant got killed. And uh, they've had no progress. So you'll have to read the book uh, to find out who was uh, sending the notes to Stephanie threatening her to stay away from the boyfriend. And you will have to find out because it's a big twist. Once Morelli reveals the counterfeiting issue, then the pieces start to fall in place. And you don't... The killers have made brief appearances the whole book. But... And there is more than one. Um... Let's see what this covered. Uh... But... It's a really complicated scheme and it's just... Maxine is the key and her mother's the key... Her mother's been passing counterfeit money around town, and the dots start to connect, and Stephanie once again accidentally comes to the truth and solves Morelli's case for him, and uh, Sally's sweet apartment also gets firebombed, and we start connecting the dots, and we find out who the culprit is, and with Sally's sweet Lula's help, uh, Joe, finally, they arrest the person that was firebombing her apartment. So, um, 
please continue to check up with me. We're going to try and do the, the Janets in 30 days in time for Christmas. Um, so look for one every other day, approximately. I've got a couple of JP Beaumonts I want to get to first. But uh, it's one for the money, two for the dough, three to get deadly, four score, uh, high five, hot six, seven up, hard eight to the nines. <laughs> I know them by heart. So join me with my 30 days of Stephanie. And I hope you have a good one. Thank you. Oh, yeah. The, uh, uh, there's discoveries at the end of the book. Who really firebombed Stephanie Singh? And who the counterfeiters are? And who the murderers are? And what happened to Eddie Kuntz? Those you will have to read the book to find out. Because I don't want to reveal all. But it's interesting. It's a really good book. Enjoy the story. Have a good one.